We are talking about the believer's legal position today in Christ. Yesterday we talked about the importance of this truth to so many Christians as they begin to fully understand what it means to be in Christ. The book of Ephesians is a book that was written at a time when the church was facing the same conditions that we are facing today. And you will find the book of Ephesians probably one of the most helpful books in our dealing with where we are in the occult, the rising of the occult in America. I have so um, much material on the New Age, Satanism, and these things that it's difficult for me to even keep up on the material I have myself. I got a, police, uh, a call from the police department in the state of Washington asking for help because they are becoming a library for all police departments across America alerting people about occult crimes. And so we're living in a time where America is turning from Christ to occultism. It's uh, very heavy on the campuses across America. And many of the campus organizations are having to really understand the young people and their battle today against the forces of darkness and going into a cult. So many young people have come here and shared experiences that if I share with you, you wouldn't believe. Very, very difficult to believe the power of the occult until you deal with person after person coming out of it. Well, the book of Ephesians was written to a young uh, church and a young man by the name of Timothy. It was Timothy's first church, and the Apostle Paul was concerned that Timothy would make an impact upon this very wicked city of Ephesus. He felt if Timothy did not impact Ephesus, Ephesus would impact Timothy. Ephesus was unique in that it had one of the ten wonders of the world, which was the Temple of Diana. The Temple of Diana was a, uh, a structure that people came just to see it. I've heard that there had a staircase in that temple carved out of a single vine. There were a thousand beautiful girls that served the goddess Diana every day in that temple. And the way the goddess Diana was worshipped was by performing immoral acts with these girls. And so it was to this wicked city that Timothy went to share the gospel. And it's in this book that 40 times in the little book, in fact, more than 40 times in the little book of six chapters, God moved upon the Apostle Paul to write about being in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And so today we want to look at what does it mean for me to be in Christ. Now, most of us understand Christ in me. But what is it, me in Christ? I want you to look at the scripture. You have a chart before you, and I want you to fill out this chart, but as we do, skip the very first line, and I want you to write the scripture verses down. Look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We talked about creature centered living. Jesus said to them all, If any wishes, or if any will, to exercise their will, to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so the Bible talks about a cross. It talks about my cross. I cannot become a Christian without understanding the finished work of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ said, it is finished, it was tremendously significant. And so Jesus said, if I would come after him, I have to learn to say no to myself, and I have to learn to die daily. If I do not do that, there is no following. Literally, he's saying, I must turn from creature-centered living. Look at Galatians 2.20, because it's just a, the Apostle Paul's testimony of himself and how he dealt with this issue of dying daily. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. So Paul said, I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ 
liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so here we're told that we there is his crucifixion and my crucifixion. And Paul said, unless I am willing to be crucified, Jesus said, unless you're willing to die to self, Jesus Christ cannot live through you. It is interesting, there are three times we're told about crucifixion. In Romans 6.6, 6, self is crucified to sin. In Galatians 2.20, literally in the context, self is crucified to the law. And in uh, Colossians, or pardon me, Galatians 6.14, self is crucified to the world. And so we have the three crucifixions mentioned there, uh, the believer to self, to sin, from self to the law, and self to the world. And then in Galatians 5.24, and put this on the same line as Galatians 2.20, it says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Let me tell you, either the flesh is dead and you are dying to the flesh, dying to self every day, or you're alive to self and self is going to run your life. And self will always run your life to uh, make a mess of it or make a wreck out of your life. The third verse that I want you to put on is found in Hebrews 2.14, a very significant verse in spiritual warfare. In fact, it's the verse uh, that sometimes when I have read, uh, wicked spirits have yelled at me and told me to stop reading this verse. They do not want to hear it. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, the Lord Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. Now, why did the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, take on flesh and blood? Why was he not an angel? Because angels cannot die. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. It says right here, they took on flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had the power of the death, and that is the devil and deliver them who through the fear of death for all their lifetime subject to bondage. Two things were dealt with at the cross. S the sin question was settled and sin was judged and Satan was judged. And Satan was defeated at the cross. And so on your chart you have a large cross and I want you to write on that his cross. I must come to his cross in order to become a Christian. But I will never be a follower unless I pick up my cross and put that in the middle. If I am not willing to die to myself, I will not follow Christ. I will follow myself. What is one of the major, major temptations that we face that the enemy throws at us? And that is to hold on to our own life. You need to be the center of your life. You need to make the decisions of your life. Don't turn your life over to Jesus Christ. You hold on to it. Now let's look at the second major thing. You have an arrow. I'd like you to, to draw on the, uh, uh, on the arrow. Just draw a line and put his resurrection. And we know that it's impossible to speak of the, of the crucifixion without the resurrection because the, the passages of scripture just come together. Even Paul said that he died and yet he didn't die. He lived. So let's look on the, uh, oh, under the, the cross you have a line there. Right, co-crucifixion. The Bible teaches that when Jesus died, I died. Now, let's, the second one is his resurrection. Let's look at Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 is an excellent verse, just a, a tremendous verse, and many young men have memorized this verse when they wanted to break sinful habits. Romans 6, verses 3 through 11. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And that's right now. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's right now. For he that is dead is freed from serving sin. Now, if he be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I would like you in the middle of that arrow to push, put a little arrow, just draw a line, a little arrow, and write my resurrection. When Jesus died, I died. When Jesus was raised, I was raised. Now let's look at some very significant scriptures here on the resurrection and the finished work of Christ. Because the finished work of Christ deals with the whole work that took place at Calvary, the, the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to uh, the Gospel of, of Luke and turn to the, the latter part of that book and we want to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's very interesting some of the statements that are made in the garden there and you don't need to put this particular verse down but I would like you to turn there before we look in the book of Colossians. Because I believe that it makes a lot more sense to us as we look in the, the last hour of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 22 is an interesting chapter in Luke. Satan uh, comes on the scene many, many times. In Luke 22, verse 3, we see that Satan actually entered into a man, and the man was Judas. What a terrible thing. And this man, as a result of the indwelling presence of Satan, eventually led him to commit suicide. And then in verse 31, the Lord Jesus made this statement, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to have you. And you know he desired to have each one of us? And he wants to sift us like wheat. But what did Jesus say? But I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. What a tremendous truth. Jesus said he'd been warned that Satan desires to sift us. Satan desires to have us. But what is he doing today? He's praying for us at the right hand of the Father. Tremendous truth. But let's go on. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he entered the most difficult time in his life, he went to the, the, the garden and there to pray. And he asked his friends that they would stand with him during his hour of darkness and they preferred to sleep you know that can be so difficult for you and I when we go through some of the darkest times in our life often our friends are asleep they don't see our needs and they sleep and the Lord said pray that you enter not into the temptation and the temptation was to sleep in the time you should be praying and they went to sleep and so the Lord went through that whole time all alone because he knows that our friends sometimes don't stand with us, but he promises never to leave us in our hour of darkness. Then we move on in the chapter as we come towards the end of the chapter after the temptation. We have the high priest and the, the religious people coming to get the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus, as they came out to get him, he made a tremendous statement here. He says in verse 53, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretch forth no hands to arrest me. What he's saying is, why are you coming to me now like a common thief? When I was with you during the day, you didn't uh, try to take me even today. But you're coming at night. And he turned to the religious rulers, and look what he says here. But this is your hour. Now what did he mean by that? He said, what you want to do, you want to destroy me. You want to kill me and this is your hour, you are going to be able to do it. And then the last statement there in the King James is so significant. He says, and the power of darkness. There were two groups that wanted to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. The one group was the religious leaders. The other group was the demonic powers. 
when Jesus died on the cross, he was attacked by demonic powers. Now, let's look and see what actually happened. And this goes on the second uh, line that I want you to put verses on. And that, let's go to the book of Colossians. And let's go to chapter 2. This is one portion of scripture in the King James I always skip. I would read along, I would come to this, I would skip it. Probably you do the same thing, don't you? When you come to something in the Bible you don't understand, you just go on. Little did I realize how significant this was for my walking in victory and having victory over the forces of darkness. I needed to understand this important passage in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now what's he saying? He's saying that when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died and he fulfilled all of the ordinances that came through the law. But verse 15 is extremely significant. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. There are three significant statements here about the spirit world. When the spirit world killed the Lord Jesus Christ, they thought it was all over. I don't know if you're aware of this, but one of the important days to a Satanist is Good Friday. And your extreme Satanist groups, the secretive groups, will seek to get a young man and crucify him Friday, all across America on Good Friday young men <clears throat> are killed and by crucifixion because that is the day they feel that Satan overpowered Jesus they forget all about the resurrection when I got the call from the police department I received it right after Easter and I asked them and they said yes we know there has been a crucifixion in our area here in the state of Washington and we are searching uh, for evidence of where the young man was crucified so it's a terrible thing and the enemy thought this was it and they rejoiced and rejoiced in his death but there were three things that took place when he died and what the Lord's using here is military terms he's relating now what he did on the cross to the very thing a king would do or an army captain would do when he would conquer another army here are the three things. The first is spoiled principalities and powers. That's demonic principalities and demonic powers. The word spoiled literally means to take away the weaponry. So when one king would conquer another army, the first thing he would do is take away the weapons of the army he conquered so that they would not have any weapons. The second thing that they did, it said he made a show of them openly. Literally, it means to put them to open shame. The second thing the king uh, they would do would be to strip the clothing off of the soldiers and they would put them to an open display and they would tie usually their hands behind their back and often to the neck of the, of, the, of the soldier behind them. You will see this on pottery. If you take a Bible dictionary, you look in there, or a Bible encyclopedia, you look in there, and you'll see these fellows either naked or with just a loincloth tied that way, walking often with their head down in, 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 in single, sometimes single file all tied together or in groups all tied together walking back and so what he would do is the one who won would parade these soldiers defeated soldiers back through the very cities in which they held captive in bondage and it was a sign to the people they no longer owed allegiance to the army it was conquered they no longer needed to fear and then the third thing he did he triumphed over them in the cross he was the victor over the spirit world in the cross. And so he is now the one seated on the horse, leading the parade. And they're saying, you no longer owe allegiance to this army and to these people. You owe allegiance to the man on the horse. You no longer need to fear the enemy, but you look at the one 
who has set us free. You look on the one on the horse. And that is the picture that God has given to us of the work of Christ on the cross. One of the most significant things that has taken place this year in our life was to be in our church on Easter Sunday. And they did a cantata called Worthy is the Lamb. And our church in the St. Louis area is noted to have one of the best choirs and the best music program in all of St. Louis. It's absolutely outstanding. And it started at the crucifixion. And the choir sang an, an opening number of, uh, I, didn't know, I can't remember what it was, something about the death of Christ. And then there was a solo by uh, supposedly Mary, the mother of Christ, and about her son dying and, and trying to fully understand why he had to die. And then the church went absolute pitch black. We have a very excellent sound system. And all of a sudden, you heard these rocks uh, breaking. There was a violent earthquake and the, the sounds were just absolutely awesome in that blackness. And out of that blackness and out of all of that rumbling and tearing came a voice that, that, that was, it beamed out in a way with pain and victory. And it said, it is finished. And it was just awesome. And I started crying in that darkness. And I thought about how true it is. It is finished. That's exactly what this was all about is exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Not only did he deal with my sin, but he secured my victory. Not only did he deal with the sin issue for eternity, but he dealt with the enemy's attack upon me as I live every day. And every day I can live and walk in the victory that Jesus Christ has given for me. And then the light slowly came on in the choir saying, worthy was the lamb that was slain. It was absolutely, unbelievably emotionally moving. Let's uh, look at another passage here, extremely important passage in spiritual warfare, and that's Ephesians chapter 2. Well, let's look at Colossians 3, 1. He said, If ye be risen, or since you're risen with Christ now, seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. See, we died with Christ, but we are not dead. We are now raised with him. An important truth. We have been risen with Christ. Where in times past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so here we see this tremendous truth. We used to walk according to the enemy. We used to be numbered with the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our lifestyle in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by our very nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for in his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he raised us up together with Christ. What a tremendous truth that is. And so put an arrow in the center of the, of the arrow, and that's your resurrection. So the outer arrow is his resurrection, the inner arrow is my resurrection, and then underneath the arrow on that long line, right, co-resurrection. So the Bible teaches co-crucifixion, the Bible teaches co-resurrection. And now we want to look at one of the most awesome truths in the Word of God. It's just, to me, Every time I read this, uh, it just overwhelms me, the truth of this. And I think of how many years I did not understand this truth. And that's Ephesians chapter 1, basically 18 to the end of the chapter. But I'll go up and read the, go up to the verse, the first verse is 15, and read this whole thing in its context. It says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I love the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you and making mention of you in my prayers. Now here is Paul, remember, praying for this church in, in an, a city that was known for its, its idolatry and immorality. The goddess of, of Di, the, the, the temple of Diana. And remember, the book of Corinthians says, idols are nothing. It's the demons behind the idols that I am concerned about the Apostle Paul said. Now he's praying for them. And look at this, the significance of this prayer. He said, I 
I cease not to give thanks to you, and I cease not making mention of you. First of all, he says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying, I'm praying that you will know God better. He's not talking about knowing about him. He's saying that what you know about him will make you wise. That God will give you a spirit of wisdom so that the reality of who Jesus Christ is and what he means to you in your walk and in your life of victory will become a reality. And I want to tell you something. As you're listening to me, unless the Spirit of God ministers to you and reveals the truth that we're going to look at right now, all you'll have is mental information and it will not affect your life unless the Spirit of God allows you to internalize this truth. The second thing he prayed is that the eyes of your understanding would be open and that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, and the inheritance. He's saying, I am praying that God will open your eyes that you might see all that is yours in Christ. All is yours, what it really means to be in Christ. And then verse 19, that you might understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. This is extremely significant. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not strong in your determination, not strong in your commitment, not strong in your Bible reading, but he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? Because we're going to face unseen forces that are committed to my destruction. Now he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He doesn't even explain what he means. He doesn't define, he just makes those statements. Why does he make those statements in verse 10? Because he explains them in chapter 1. And he assumes you read chapter 1 by the time you get there. So let's look at this very significant thing. Let's look at verse 19 again. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? This mighty, mighty power of God. Now what is this exceeding greatness of his power and mighty power? Just said, if he just said that you might understand God's power, it would be tremendous. But he uses those superlatives. Exceeding greatness and mighty. And he said, I want you to understand the power that is available to you for living victoriously against the forces of darkness, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Have you ever been to a funeral? If you have been to a funeral, and let's say that you were standing there and I said, aren't you a Christian? Yes. Do you see my friend right here? My friend is dead, and I love him very much. You're a Christian. Do something. What would you do? Literally, you'd have to tell me, there is nothing I can do. This situation is hopeless. And he's saying, the power that God has is power for hopeless situations. It's power that can give life to a dead man. No one can do it. They can freeze you. They can freeze dry you. They can stuff you. They can put you in these vaults. They can do all this stuff. But they can't give life to a dead man. And it's the power that gives life to a dead man. The second thing he tells us to try that we might understand something of his power, it's not only the kind of power that can put life in a dead man, but it can take that man, raise him off the ground, and take him into the very presence of God. And we know something of that power because we know the kind of power it takes to put a man on the moon. And God said that's the kind of power that's available to you to stand against the forces of darkness. Look at verse 21 now. Far above all demonic principality, demonic powers, demonic might, and demonic dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is extremely significant. What is he saying here? He said that the demonic world, well, first of all, let's look at this. 
Where is Christ today? Christ is in heaven. What is he doing in heaven? He is seated. Why is he sitting down? Is it because he's tired? No. It's because it speaks of the finished work of Christ. When the Old Testament priests went into the holies of holies with the blood and put it on the mercy seat, there was no place to sit because he had to come back in another year and do the same thing. Year after year he came in because his sacrifice only covered sin. But when Jesus came, John the Baptist pointed and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He offered the divine sacrifice once and forever. And so the Lord Jesus Christ offered the sacrifice. God received the eternal sacrifice of his son. And Jesus Christ is now seated in heaven as a constant reminder that the enemy and the sin question have been dealt with once and for all. And then it says he's taken the demonic world and he's placed it under him. Is it under his head? Yes. But is that what he says? No. Is it under his body? Yes, it's under his body, but that's not the part, a part of his body that he, is, that he is pointing out to us. He said, under his feet. Why his feet? Because when a king, in the Old Testament, look at Joshua, when a king conquered another king, he would bring out that king, make him lay down on the ground, and he would put his foot on the neck of that king and then cut off his head. Would you let anyone put their foot on your neck? Not unless you were totally defeated. Because just a little pressure, and that's all they wrote. And so here is the enemy, totally defeated under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at your chart, and you want to put on the outside of, the, of this throne, his throne, and now I want you to draw a little throne inside of that and write my throne. And let's look at the significant verse, Ephesians 2, 6. And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are we today? We have been raised up. What are we doing in the heavenly in Christ? We're sitting. And we're seated in Christ in the heavenlies. And where is the spirit world in relationship to me? Under my feet. The enemy is defeated. And he's under your feet. And we need to live like that. You and I need to know our power and our authority in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you will not walk in victory. The enemy is defeated. He is under your feet and he has no right to have any rule or any hold on your life. What a tremendous truth of God that is. And I trust that God will make that very real to you. The arrow on the chart is the return of Christ. And you can write return in that, in that little uh, arrow. And if you're a Christian, you return with him. Then let's look. We have the crown, and of course, that is his crown. Oh, I'm sorry, under the chair, under the throne, the co-exaltation. So under the cross, you have co-crucifixion. Under the arrow, co-resurrection. Under the chair, co-exaltation. And then you have his crown, and of course, you can draw a little crown inside, and that's my crown. Look at Second Timothy. This is your three scriptures now to go um, on your lines there on the chart. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And so we are going to reign with him. So you have his crown and my crown. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Colossians 3, 4 states, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And then the last verse that's so tremendous is Revelation 22, 5. Just about the very, the very last chapter and, and close to some of the final statements of the whole uh, word of God. 
And it says, There shall be no night there, and there shall be no need of candle, neither light of sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now let us go to the little chart now that is under the cross and under the the, the little arrow of resurrection. And that is co-reigning under the, under the crown. But now we have, and you have on your chart, the subjection of angels, principalities, and powers. Let's look at these three verses. Philippians, uh, I mean, pardon me, Peter, 1 Peter 3. When people are struggling, I love this, to, to share with them this verse. 1 Peter 3.22. It says, The Lord Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels, authorities, and powers are subject unto him. Now, this is not good angels. The good angels already are subject unto him. But these angels were made subject unto him when he ascended into heaven. In the finished work of Christ, the demonic world was put subject unto him. The authorities and powers will, will have to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we always come against the powers of darkness in Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Think of this one. I know you know this verse, but probably you've never thought of this before. I really uh, marvel. One day I was just looking at this, and it just dawned on me what God was saying. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Are you going to sit in judgment on good angels? Why would you judge good angels? They always do what God says. You're going to judge wicked spirits. You're going to judge fallen angels. You and I are going to sit in judgment on a demonic world. What a truth. A tremendous truth. And so if you find yourself under attack, so you better watch it, guys. I am in Christ, and one day I'm going to sit in judgment on you. And I don't mean that to be light. It's a tremendous truth. And then the last truth we want to look at is Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who humbled himself to become obedient unto death. He said, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that at every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, be ye Pardon me, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. What does he say here? He said that every tongue shall confess, and that's things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is all the spirit world. Every single demonic spirit in Satan himself will acknowledge, yes, Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. Jesus Christ is the victor. And they will do it to the glory of the Father. And then in the large uh, square on the bottom of your chart, write this in there. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on your legal position in Christ. Every single day, God wants me to die to myself and be alive to him, realizing that I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies and the spirit world is under my feet. And from that position, I can have victory over the forces of darkness. Oh, Father, remind me daily of my position in Christ, that the enemy cannot stand 
before me, when I stand in my legal position. Father, I just ask that the truths of what we've studied and the truth of this chart will dawn on our hearts and that we might see that we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Amen.